Hey, it's Joel here at the top of the show. I just wanted to shout out some Patreons, Jason, Philip, and Helen. Thank you so much uh, for supporting us. We appreciate all of our Patreons. It really does uh, enable us to make this content and, and do the show. And a big thank to all of our listeners as, we, uh, as we're as we still ironing out some of the, the technical kinks that comes with recording internationally with Troy and Cambodia. We're still working on getting Troy's studio kind of set up and finalized there, but we got a good episode today with Oswald Chambers, uh, narrated by Jonathan Clausen, who I always love his narration. So uh, enjoy the episode. Revived Thoughts is a production of Revive Studios. This is Troy and Joel, and you are listening to Revive Thoughts. Jesus Christ is the worthy one, not because he was God incarnate, but because he was God incarnate, being made in the likeness of men. Every episode, we bring you a different voice from history and a sermon that they deliver. Today's sermon comes to us from Oswald Chambers. It's entitled Divine Paradox, and it uh, would have been preached sometime in the early 1900s. Troy, how are you doing? I'm doing well, Joel. Um, Joel, we uh, have not seen you in a short bit. We had Patrick Studebaker it's been a hot second. from Cave to the Cross podcast last week. I listened to that episode. It was really good. So we, we missed you, and we're glad you are back. And we have a classic sermon. This is a sermon by Oswald Chambers this week. We have not um, done him in a long time, but he has been covered once on this show before. So if you listen to this episode, you like this episode, we encourage you to go back and check out that other one we did on Oswald Chambers chambers too. Uh, But this is a fun episode. If you like to kind of spider web out like I do and see how like if you like it when interesting characters from history run into each other, this is kind of an episode where you're going to see several, you know, names of revived thoughts that kind of run through Oswald Chambers' life and kind of help him reach the point that he gets to. So be ready to, I guess, you know, look up some more sermons on us and be ready to get ready to listen to some more after this one is done. Yeah, we've done an episode on Oswald Chambers. Uh, already. So the name might sound familiar, but we're, we're excited to give him another episode on the Revive Thoughts lineup. Oswald Chambers was born in 1874 in Scotland, and despite his dad being a Baptist preacher, his own faith, it, it took a while for it to, to grow and to catch hold. When he was 15, that all changed. That was the year 1889, and you know, Troy and I often talk about if we could go back to any era, any time, uh, in church history, we always talked about it would be awesome to go back to the late 1800s. And, uh, you know, if, if we were to place ourselves back in 1889 in Charles Spurgeon's church, we might find ourselves sitting in a pew next to Oswald Chambers on the same day uh, as, a fi- you know, when he was 15 years old, hearing a sermon from Charles Spurgeon. On his way home from church that day, he asked his father what it meant to be a believer. I can only imagine how exciting his father <laughs> must have been uh, to see his son showing that curiosity and that intent and wanting to come to know Jesus. And he was a very talented individual. He was uh, really artistic, which which I love to see. I you know I, I I do a bit of videography myself. I, I like to see the artistic side of uh, of preachers, um, which we get to see. I'd say. A decent amount of the time, I feel like I feel like uh, artistic talent accompanies a lot of preachers. Yeah, I'm coming um, to especially musicians. Yeah, I'm coming to like a, a secret conclusion. Like, if I was going to write a book for how to be a man or how to live up to maybe the old days, I'd write something like the uh, the Renaissance Christian. You know, because a lot of these guys they have a fine yeah. appreciation <laughs> for music, a fine appreciation for mm-hmm. books and stuff. And and I do wonder if maybe we've lost that touch to the higher arts that I, I you do see come up over and over again with these gentlemen. Yeah. Yeah, creativity. I mean, God. God is a very creative individual, right? God created the universe. Uh, that's that's part of our innate being uh, is to be creative as well. He was a good musician. His brother actually went on to be a professional musician. Oswald Chambers would eventually go on to be a pastor, but you know, also a very talented musician in his own right. 
So Oswald, instead of going, you know, maybe on directly to the path of pastoralship, uh, he goes to the Royal School of Art in London for two years in England. Probably not the easiest school to get into. So it tells you he was, uh, you know, again, pretty good at what he was doing. And while he was there, he sat under the preaching of another famous Revithos name. So now we've had Spurgeon, a second one, Alexander White. Now, Alexander White's a great uh, preacher, but we've talked about him a lot. So go check out his episodes because I think Joel and I think some of those are the most interesting episodes possible because Alexander White's both a really good preacher, but also a very interesting, flawed man. So go listen to that. But he was profoundly touched by White's preaching and never felt quite right doing art yet he loved doing it he was talented at it but it just didn't sit like it was like what he was supposed to do with his life his friend said you know you really seem to love god maybe, maybe ministry is for you but he resisted he was like no i'm going to do this art thing and so he was supporting himself through art school he was doing freelance paintings and eventually his money ran out he just couldn't get any more for what he needed to do and he felt like it was god tightening his grip on him saying you know i don't want you to continue down the road you're going but he did not want to get it give in Finally, one night, he lays an entire, side, an entire night aside to just spend it all in prayer, to just decide one way or the other, what am I going to do? And he said he knew by the end of it that it was God's will for him to go into ministry. There was no choice. So he finally kind of gives in. Okay, I'll go into ministry. And that morning, he says that someone gives him a brochure for a place called Dunoon Theological Seminary. And so that's where he decides to go. Um, he goes from this really prestigious, nice, you know, university known around the entire world, the entire empire of Britons, to a small Bible college with 30 other students, one teacher, and they kind of all lived at his house. They all ate together, and it was just, they're all packed in there. And uh, a lot of his friends were like, are you sure this is what you're supposed to be doing with your life? But he, he felt like this is what God had told him to do. So it's in this moment Oswald runs into his third very famous person in his life. Despite the fact that his school was very small, the person running it worked really hard to get guest speakers. And he got the famous F.B. Myers. And we've recently done an episode on F.B. Myers. When F.B. Myers was at uh, his school, he preached a sermon on the power of the Holy Spirit. And Chambers uh, was blown away by this, and he wanted God to fill him with the Holy Spirit and baptize him, you know, in the Holy Spirit, like Myers was preaching about. And this began an era of his life that he would describe as hell on earth. That's his words. That's the quote he gives there. He was miserable. You know, he he, he called it a spiritual dryness. Looking at it, it, it's hard to put into words. I think it's it's one of those things where the spirit was calling him to surrender his life and he was holding on to some selfishness you know in that like he feels alone he feels separated from god i think it's almost the opposite i think it's where you know god is with him trying to get him to surrender because this goes on he, he says it goes on for four years where he feels um overwhelmed and that he couldn't be much use for god and his friends, you know, admittedly during this time did a lot of work with him to help counsel him and help uh, keep him from breaking down, like into nervous breakdowns. And one day he got up in front of the church and he had this big public confession where he confessed all of his sins. He, he talked about how great of a sinner he was and he talked about his need to rely more on God. And it was this public confession that seemed uh, to change everything in him and whether that was you know partially psychological on his hand or because that's what the the spirit was convicting him to confess and to surrender himself to god probably a combination of the two but it was from that moment on that he said that he experienced that that power of the holy spirit in his life uh, dwelling with him in that era of separation from god that spiritual dryness ended so after that he would spend about nine years at kind of bible college seminary and after he was done he would go to the u.s to teach and preach and work at a bible school there uh, then he would go on to a place you might not expect in this area. Era, uh, he's, I think, the first person in all of Revive Thoughts catalog to go there. Tokyo, Japan. He knew about a Bible school there that was doing some missionary work, and he wanted to check it out. He wanted to learn from the missionaries in Japan because one of the things he had given himself over to doing after he left school was to spend 12 years traveling, spending time as a missionary, and, and in learning about the world so that he'd be prepared for what came next. At that time, missions was going very well in Japan. However, if you know much about Japan, it will not go well for long. If you'd like to learn what happens to Japan and learn about the history of Christians there, check out Elise's episodes um, over on the rise and fall of Christianity in Japan, part one and two, over at Martyrs and Missionaries. 
So after learning as much as he can from the mission work there, he's really encouraged by what he sees, and he's hoping to bring it with him in his future missions. He heads back to the U.S., and while he's on the boat, he meets a lady that he likes. Um, he'll he'll eventually call her name is kind of like Gerbert or Gertrude or something like that, but he calls her B D two initials, which is <laughs> beloved disciple, and that just becomes his affectionate nickname for her, which is Biddy. I you know hey it works for him and works for her. They'll court on and off for a bit for two years as they're on different continents doing different work, but eventually they do get married. But I actually think it's their engagement, which is kind of sweet because they get engaged in front of a painting that they both liked in England of Jesus knocking on the door and holding holding a lamp to be the light of the world, knocking on the hearts of men is kind of symbolically this picture is. And he wanted to get engaged her in front of that spot because he wanted their lives to be a reflection of what God is doing for the world. And so he wanted their marriage and everything they did to be a reflection of that painting of Jesus knocking on the door and bringing the light to the world, which I think is romantic and pretty cool. Chambers um, was doing a lot of preaching and teaching, and he did not believe and taking notes. So he believed he would study and work hard. And then when he got up to speak, he was supposed to rely on the Holy Spirit to guide his words. But despite that, his wife was a trained court stenographer. And so she wrote down everything he said perfectly as he said it. And so we have all his works because of his wife, not because of any notes he took. Yeah. And he finally felt like he was at a place to start a Bible college. He wanted to help train pastors. He wanted to help talk them through and, and kind of uh, encourage them in their own ministry. So in 1911, he started a Bible college and it was a, a kind of a smaller intimate setting. He taught about 25 students all day long. And then in the evenings, he would go preach at local churches in the evenings. And so he had these full, I can't even imagine how many hours in each day. And he ran the same type of school that he had gotten to, right? Where the students learn and ate together and their professors, you know, would eat lunch with them and they would, they would chat and learn. And it, you know, it was this kind of environment where uh, it was conducive to conversation and to learning. His daughter was born in 1913. Kathleen Chambers was her name. And in 1914, we're in England, right? World War I kicks off. And so Chambers felt called to join the cause. And so he teams up with the YMCA and he went to Egypt. And once he got to Egypt and settled down there, uh, he called for his family. And if you remember our episode on uh, Jay Gress and Machen, where he was uh, in the YMCA camps, they're brutal places. There's a lot of injuries. There's a lot of uh, disease and uh, just unpleasant sights, you know, people missing limbs. and uh, But yet, Chambers called for his family to be with him there. Their child was, was probably the only kid in the entire uh, YMCA camp there during World War One. I just, you know, imagine the different places you raise your family, how many people are going, I need to get my daughter and my wife into this, you know, camp that could be overrun by Ottoman Turk, you know, soldiers at any point. Yet that was where Chambers felt that they needed to be because he wanted to keep them all together, which I think is very sweet and very, um, very brave on the other side of it. He oversaw soldiers returning from the Gal Battle of Gallipoli, which was a big defeat you know, of the British to the, at the hands of the Turks. Over 30,000 British would die with like nearly 80,000 injured. It was a big blow on the on the side of the thing. So this was a tough area to be. He's seeing those soldiers coming in and out um, and taking care of them, tending to them and looking after them. Chambers didn't get along well with his superiors. He, um, he tended to give away all the tea and hot chocolate and cakes, and the YMCA was supposed to be selling them from the salaries the soldiers made. Um, they were supposed to pay a little bit, and his superiors kind of snapped on him and said, look, if you get them used to getting this stuff for free, what are they going to do when they go to the next YMCA? Uh, but Chambers said, I'm never going to make British soldiers fight and die, but then pay for tea and cakes. That's just too much. Bundling home and car insurance with GEICO is so easy, your neighbors are probably already doing it. But who? They may drop little hints like... Beautiful day out. Even more beautiful since we saved by bundling our home and car insurance with GEICO. Or... Yard work is hard. Much harder than bundling with GEICO, which was easy. Or it may be even subtler, like... Speaking of burgers, we bundled our home and car insurance with GEICO and saved a bunch of money. Bundling is easy with GEICO. Just ask your neighbors. And now it's Geico's Motorcycle Rules of the Road. Before you ride, make sure your mirrors are clean and adjusted properly. And if you're going on a group ride, make sure the lead biker knows where they're going. Uh, Ed, quick question. Where are you taking us? Oh, I have no idea. Well, am I the leader? <laughs> because I was uh, following that dude with the red helmet. Where, Where is he? And the rule to saving on motorcycle insurance is, in 15 minutes, GEICO could save you 15% or more. Uh, 
Um, at the YMCA camp, the spiritual things were almost completely forgotten. Even though the YMCA was originally founded in the 1840s with this very spiritual mission, by the time of World War One, that mission was nearly gone. And you know, we know today the YMCA is not a very Christian organization. Um, but at the time, they were playing concerts and they were putting movies and picture shows on for the soldiers. He's kind of entertaining things to keep the soldiers from hitting the bars and the brothels with all their free time. And then Chambers one day surprised the YMCA workers and said, you know, we're all done with these frivolous things and these entertainments. We're going to do church services and Bible classes now. And so he canceled the movies and canceled the concerts. And everyone thought the facilities would be abandoned and that the soldiers would head back to the brothels and bars like they were doing before. And I read this quote. I don't know how to say it better. So I just wanted to read this quote to you. This is the way it was described. Uh, Quote, what the skeptics had not considered was Chambers' unusual personal appeal, his gift in speaking, and his genuine concern for the men. Soon his wooden framed hut was packed with hundreds of soldiers listening attentively to messages such as, what good, what is the good of prayer? And so you can see he made his messages really simple for soldiers going through a hard time, but somehow he convinced soldiers who were on the brink of life and death that more important than watching a movie or listening to a concert and just relaxing and more important than going to a bar and brothel was to hear the word of God spoken. And that's, if that's not an incredible testimony to just the work of God there, I don't know what is. Yeah. So when, Late 1917, uh, Chambers started feeling bad. He started feeling sick, and he didn't want to go to a doctor or take the doctors away from the soldiers. But after a while, he had to go. He was in too much pain, and it turned out he had appendicitis. While they were operating on him, he died. He didn't survive the surgery. And we pointed out in a previous episode, you know, what might have happened if he had been outside of a military camp, right? Uh, You know, appendicitis relatively simple operation to to conduct is kind of a a sad thing that uh that would be ultimately what ended up taking his life and it's easy he's 43 at this point so it's easy to think that he didn't live a full life or you know that, that he had so much more promise but um he really had a tremendous he had more impact in his 43 years of life and really you know he got saved at 15 so even less than that then a lot of preachers have uh, in lifespans that are double that. His wife, as Troy mentioned, wrote all of this stuff down. Chambers wasn't a big writer, uh, but it's through his wife's works and publishing all of these little devotionals and sermons of his that, that we now are able to remember him today. There's a collection of works called My Utmost for His Highest. Uh, that includes several of his writings, and there are several other writings as well that became world classic, world famous. On a side note, Troy... I don't know if you remember, we talked about this in, in, in our first episode, but I was actually able to uh, to be, to be see his gravesite there in Egypt. I was there. They buried him in Egypt because that's where he died. And they have his, uh, you, you can you can literally just walk up to his tombstone at the cemetery. I have photos of it. It's very fascinating. That is really cool. I did completely forget that. But yes, I forgot that that is yeah. true. So you know what? Maybe we can post another <laughs> one of those photos on our social media pages when this episode goes out. If you want to see one of the co-hosts, you know, taking a live action shot of that spot where Oswald Chambers was buried. And he was buried with full military honors. Like even though he was not a soldier, the British Empire thanked him for his service even before, you know, he was famous, famous. Uh, In some ways, this sermon is kind of talking about things like that, by the way, how God uses paradoxes, how the death of Chambers led to his life's work actually reaching so many more people than he probably would have if he had stayed alive. God uses paradoxes. There's just these things going on where things that we see don't make sense, but on a spiritual world, you know, God uses them to do so much more than we would have ever thought. This sermon kind of touches on that and talks about it. And just, you know, more than any other sermon, think about who this sermon was being preached to. The sermon's over a hundred years old for sure. Yet this sermon very likely was being preached to soldiers sitting around a wooden frame hut on a dusty battlefield near Cairo, Egypt, surrounded by all these soldiers listening to this man speak, Oswald Chambers, instead of going to a bar or a brothel, this is what they came to hear that day. And you're getting to listen to that again after a hundred years. There is probably no more prominent feature in Bible revelation than that of paradox. In Revelation 5, the Apostle John records that in his vision, he was told, The Lion of the tribe of Judah has prevailed to open the book. And he says, Lo, in the midst of the throne 
stood a lamb. We find another paradox that is similar in the book of Isaiah. The prophet has been looking for some great conquering army of the Lord, and instead he sees a lonely figure, traveling in the greatness of his strength. If you take all the manifestations of God in the Old Testament, you find them a mass of contradictions. Now God is pictured as a man, now as a mother, now as a lonely hero, now as a suffering servant, and until we come to the revelation in the New Testament, these conflicting characteristics add confusion to our conception of God. But immediately, we see Jesus Christ. We find all the apparent contradictions blended in one unique person. Henry Drummond titled his book Natural Law in the Spiritual World, but surely he makes a fundamental blunder by that very statement alone. For there is a law in the natural world, and so there is also a law in the spiritual world. But they are not the same laws. The one is the complement of the other. Unless this is kept in mind by the student of Scripture, and he learns to rely on the Holy Spirit to interpret the spiritual law, he will end only in confusion. In fact, he will be in danger of disparaging the spiritual law in the Bible universe in favor of the natural law in the common sense universe. And I saw in the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book, sealed with seven seals. Revelation 5.1 I am considering the book in one aspect only. As Revelation contains knowledge of the future, understands the providence of God in the present, and together it gives us a grasp of the past. The deepest clamor of a man's nature, once he is awake, is to know the where and the why of life. Where do I come from? Why am I here? Where am I going? In all ages, men have tried to pry into the secrets of the future. Astrologers, necromancers, spiritualists, or whatever name you may call them by, have all tried to open the book, but without success, because it is a sealed book. I wept much, says John, because no one was found worthy to open the book or to look thereon. Because of the sealed character of the book, men become indifferent and cease to be worried over the where and what of human destiny. They take no interest in Bible revelation and are amused at our earnest pleading on their behalf. It is all about something we cannot know, and there is no one who can tell us. Others say, there is nothing to know. Not, we cannot know, but there is nothing to know. A man lives his life and then dies, and that is all there is. The psalmist refers to such men when he says, The fool has said in his heart, There is no God. There are others whose sensitive spirit gives them an implicit sense that there is more than this life. There are hidden deeps in their heart that human life and its friendships can never satisfy. The scenes of earth, its sunsets and sunrises, its huge and thoughtful nights, all awaken an elemental sadness which makes them wonder why they were born. And they feel keenly because the book is sealed and there is no one able to open it. But if only all men knew that there is someone who is worthy to open the book, and one of the elders spoke to me, weep not. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has prevailed to open the book and to loosen the seven seals there. Revelation 5.5 5. Who is this worthy one? If one may say it with reverence, realizing the limitation of language, God himself had to be proved worthy to open the book. In the person of Jesus Christ, God became man. He trod this earth with naked feet and wrought with human hands the creed of creeds in loveliness and perfect deeds. By his holy life, by his moral integrity, and supreme spiritual greatness. Jesus Christ proved that he was worthy to open the book. The book can be opened by only one hand, the pierced hand of the worthy one, our Savior Jesus Christ. The childish idea that because God is great, he can do anything, good or bad, right or wrong, and we must say nothing, is wrong. The meaning of moral worth is that certain things are impossible to do. It is impossible for God to lie. It is impossible for Jesus Christ to contradict his own holiness or to become other than he is. The profound truth for us is that Jesus Christ 
is the worthy one, not because he was God incarnate, but because he was God incarnate on the human plane. Being made in the likeness of men, he accepted our limitations and lived on this earth a life of perfect holiness. Napoleon said of Jesus Christ that he had succeeded in making every human soul an appendage of his own. Why? Because he had the genius of holiness. There have been great military geniuses, intellectual giants, geniuses of statesmen, but these only exercise influence over a limited number of men. Jesus Christ exercises unlimited sway over all men because he is the altogether worthy one. And I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne stood a lamb as it had been slain. Revelation 5 6. Jesus Christ is the supreme sacrifice for the sin of the world. He is the Lamb of God, which takes away the sin of the world. How the death of Jesus looms all through the Bible. It is through his death that we are made partakers of his life and can have gifted to us a pure heart, which he says is the condition for seeing God. Having seven eyes, the Lamb is not only the supreme sacrifice for man's sin, but he is the searcher of hearts searching to the innermost recesses of mind and motive. It is not a curious searching, not an odd searching, but the deep, wholesome searching the Holy Spirit gives in order to convict men of their sin and need of a Savior. Then when they come to the cross and through it accept deliverance from sin, Jesus Christ becomes the sovereign over their lives, and they love him personally and passionately, beyond all other loves of earth. And he came and took the book out of the right hand of him that sat upon the throne. Revelation 5-7 Jesus Christ and he alone is able to satisfy the craving of the human heart to know where and what of life. He enables men to understand that they have come into this life from a deep purpose in the heart of God, that the one thing they are here for is to get readjusted to God and become his lovers. And where are we going? We are going to where the book of life is opened, and we enter into an abundance of glory which we can only begin to imagine now in rare moments. In the days of his flesh, Jesus Christ exhibited this divine paradox of the lion and the lamb. He was the lion in majesty, rebuking the winds and demons. He was the lamb in meekness, who when he was reviled, did not revile back. He was the lion in power, raising the dead. He was the lamb in patience, who was brought as a lamb to the slaughter. And as a sheep before her shearers is dumb, so he did not open his mouth. He was the lion in authority. You have heard that it has been said. But I say to you, he was the lamb in gentleness. Suffer the little children to come to me. And he took them up in his arms, put his hands upon them, and blessed them. In our personal lives, Jesus Christ proves himself to be all this. He is the Lamb to expiate our sins, to lift us out of condemnation, and plant within us his own heredity of holiness. He is the Lion to rule over us, so that we gladly say, The power of this life will be upon his shoulder. And what is true in individual life is to be true also in the universe at large. The time is coming when the lion of the tribe of Judah will reign, and when the kingdoms of this world will become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ. One remaining paradox in Revelation 6.16, the wrath of the lamb is mentioned. We know what the wrath of a lion is like, but the wrath of the lamb... It is beyond our conception. All one can say about it, it is that the wrath of God is the terrible reverse side of the love of God. He 
Stephanie mentioned, it's because of the sealed character of the book that this these words are not known um, to so many people. God doesn't lay out the plan just in the hearts of every man. And so because of that, many people do not care about what is going to happen next. They don't think much about the eternal destiny of their souls or that the world is someday going to end or any of those things. Those things just don't matter to 99% of humans. And um, I've really kind of been reminded of that as I live here right now in Cambodia when I talk with students and I interact with them and they're Buddhists or they're sci- or they're just kind of atheistic and they really they just have no interest or thought or cares about what happens to them after they die and so many people live that way and it's the job of us as believers to get them to ask those questions what am I what is going to happen to me after I die and what do I believe and am I so certain I believe that and the, getting them to those questions and encouraging them with the words of life that come from the gospels Thank you for listening to today's episode of Revived Thoughts. Today's sermon was narrated by Jonathan Clausen. Jonathan Clausen started with the Clear Channel Radio in the 90s. Jonathan has worked in audio and marketing for 20 years. Credits include stints on EA Tiburon, Christianity Today, Christ and Pulp Culture, and Freelance Voice as talent for audiobooks and podcast production services. We have a lot of you who are now new, who are just finding the show. Maybe this is one of your first episodes. Maybe you came to us from Martyrs and Missionaries, or maybe you found this show specifically, but uh, maybe you found it through our memes on our page. I don't know, but there have been a lot of new people checking out the show lately, and we wanted to let you know we have a Patreon page, that uh, whole premium benefit package. If you did not know, have not checked that out. Uh, If you join on our Patreon, you will get a bookmark from us for your favorite shows martyrs and missionaries and revive thoughts you will get um if you join the higher tier you will get a mug or something like that or a shirt too you will also get access to an ad free line so if you like listening to your shows and want to skip the ads because you're paying in you get that privilege and you also get access to a um, little behind the mics that me and Joel have done, but I think probably the most exciting things are the deep dives, which are these long hour and a half and two hour episodes. We've done one on the first crusades. We've done uh, one on the Salem witch trials that is all full of creepy things. So if you enjoy that, and we've done one on Joan of Arc asking the question, did she really hear the voice of God? They're all really good. We in fact had a listener reach out to me recently and say, Hey, you need to get back on those. Cause I'm ready for the next one. So um, they're really enjoyable. There's lots of, there's some other benefits too. So check out, the patreon page look at that and maybe this is a good time to jump in and help us out every dollar goes back to making these shows better and we would not be able to do it without those who have helped us out and said hey i'm going to give a little bit of a financial commitment to seeing um, these church history podcasts flourish and and do more for the world and you know create more edifying content and so we're really thankful to those of you who have jumped on and signed on and we're really encouraging those of you who are new to check it out maybe it'll be something you uh, like and find interest in This is Troy and Joel, and this is Revive Thoughts. Bundling home and car insurance with GEICO is so easy, your neighbors are probably already doing it. But who? They may drop little hints like... Beautiful day out. Even more beautiful since we saved by bundling our home and car insurance with GEICO. Or... Yard work is hard. Much harder than bundling with GEICO, which was easy. Or it may be even subtler, like... Speaking of burgers, we bundled our home and car insurance with GEICO and saved a bunch of money. Bundling is easy with GEICO. Just ask your neighbors. And now it's GEICO's Motorcycle Rules of the Road. Before you ride, make sure your mirrors are clean and adjusted properly. And if you're going on a group ride, make sure the lead biker knows where they're going. Uh, Ed, quick question. Where are you taking us? Oh, I have no idea. What, well, am I the leader? <laughs> because I was uh, following that dude with the red helmet. Where, Where is he? And the rule to saving on motorcycle insurance is, in 15 minutes, Geico could save you 15% or more.